Welcome then, ladies and gentlemen, to a very, very special evening. The 1980s have come to be remembered as something of a second coming for Jaguar Motorsport, thanks to TWR. Nearly 30 years had passed since the successes of the D-Types, and in that time, Jaguar had not been directly involved in motor racing at all. But all of this was to change in 1984 when Jaguar was freed from the shackles of British Leyland ownership. With Sir John Egan driving the privatised company forward, Jaguar would return to motorsport with monumental success. That success was owed to Jaguar's partnership with TWR. There are stories about TWR right from the very beginning, from the days of preparing Mazda RX-7s through to the Rover SD1 touring cars, and of course those iconic XJS Group A touring cars that dominated the European series. Pick any one of those subjects and we could spend all evening on just one of them. But tonight we're focused on the events that led up to and resulted in the 1988 and 1990 Le Mans wins. TWR took their first Jaguar prototype in Group C to Le Mans in 1985 and in 1988 achieved one of those where were you when moments by winning Le Mans with uh, Andy Wallace, who we'll meet in just a moment, who drove alongside Jan Lammers and Johnny Dumfries at the wheel of one of the iconic purple liveried XJR9s. I'm wearing my purple tie tonight in honour of the Silk Cup partnership, which we'll talk about a little bit further. This success would go on to see them later creating some legendary road cars like the XJR15, the XJ220, and of course the Jaguar Sport tuned versions of Jaguar's model range at the time. I'm sure lots of you in this room have your own memories of 1988 at Le Mans. So to try and jog those memories, let's remind ourselves of that special moment in 1988 by just watching back the final lap of the race. And it looks as if Jaguar and Tom Walkinshaw have been able to keep that promise that they made when they first competed three years ago. But they've got them together in first, fourth and sixteenth places, numbers 2, 22 and 21. Line ahead, the English section of the crowd at least, which is a very large section, going absolutely raving spare now with excitement is what they came to see, what they hoped to see last year and they didn't. Well, Jaguar are not going to be the disappointing factor now at Le Mans. They're all waving the flags. Look at the marshals waving all the flags as they come round to the finish. And the marshals know, the crowd know, the drivers must know. It's just minutes to go now before the end of the 1988 Le Mans 24-hour race and Jaguars in line-ahead formation are making their way down the Mulsanne Strait for what will probably be the last time in this historic effort towards victory for 1988. Champagne already in the pit signaling area. Well, they've decided that Jaguar have won. The crowd have decided that Jaguar have won. And I think even now, Sir John Egan, who's been here to watch this race, to provide encouragement for the team throughout, has decided that at last this victory has come true. For him, for Tom Walkinshaw, and all the team who've been competing here at Le Mans, it looks as if they've done the job. Is this going to be the last lap of the 1988 Le Mans 24-hour race? It looks to me as if they might be a little bit premature, but we'll have to wait and see. All the flags are going, the crowd are surging forward, they've climbed what appeared to me to be impregnable barriers to get across the road, and it's only when we come into the pit area here that we'll see whether or not that massive crowd are going to mean that this is the last lap. Uh, this is absolutely superb. The, the stand on the opposite side of the pits just rises row by row by row, and the roar just grows. Just listen to this as they come past. Feel this. And historic finish. We waited a very long time for it. For the first time in 31 years, a British Jaguar wins at Le Mans. The Bush dynasty is ended.
Tom Walkinshaw could have settled for a good career as a works driver, and anyone who's seen the YouTube channel of him driving the Group A XJS will know that to be true. But by 1977, he was uh, BMW GB's motorsport manager, a connection that would ultimately lead to the birth of TWR. Uh, Richard, I'm going to introduce you here because you probably worked alongside Tom Walkinshaw uh, very closely at your time on the board. So tell us a little bit more about the man himself. What was Tom like? Um, he was a very hard taskmaster, and I say that with great respect. The one thing Martin said about if you were part of Tom's gang, you knew you were a bit special. None of us ever really sort of wanted to admit to that, but when you got invited into the family, it was a special place to be. And he worked you hard, I can vouch for that, you know, I mean, there was never a dull moment, and if Tom had an idea and he wanted it to happen, it happened very quickly, otherwise you were you know, made very clear that it didn't take long for you to work out where your future lay if you didn't get the job done. But I always, personally, I always found him incredibly fair. Uh, he was very generous at times when we all worked extremely hard. He was occasionally, you know, send you off on a bit of a weekend break or stuff, and he wouldn't really want any praise for it at all, but you were always expected to give your all, and I always found him a great guy to work for. I worked with Ron Dennis in McLaren, uh, Frank Williams in Formula One, and then I had a period at Ferrari as well with Schumacher. But you always knew where you stood with Tom, and that was what I personally really enjoyed working with him, Wayne. Let's start firstly with you, Alan, because uh, although we're focusing a little bit on, of course, 1988 and 1990, it's only right that we put that into context of what had gone before, and especially around the Group A XJ so give us a bit of background about the troublesome birth for that program and how it led to the success of Group C later on. It all started at the end of 81. Tom and I went to Jaguar and suggested that we should try and race an XJS. John Egan said it was a great idea but he had no money. Uh, Tom then told me that I should go and have a holiday because we weren't going to go motor racing and I arrived back from my holiday and Paul and Kevin had an XJS Jag. Um, just briefly, the, the XJS Jaguar, I think, was a, a program that had a huge amount of difficulty to get started. Jaguar had a huge problem selling the cars. They sold 1,000 cars in 1980 and 1,000 cars in 81. The minute we started racing in 82, they sold 2,500, 83, 3 84,000 around five, five and a half thousand. So a car that was actually stopped in production in 1980 that Jaguar weren't sure whether it was going to continue, I think uh, is totally reliant on the motor racing. Uh, a couple of things that we developed in the engines, uh, we made our own special head gasket and that's the head gasket that ended up in standard production in Jaguar. That came straight out of the racing program. Let's then move over to the man that designed the car we're here to celebrate. And uh, Tony, I just want to sort of take a little bit of time to look back on your career and take people to the beginning of how it started because you very nearly worked for Jaguar as a very, very young guy, didn't you? But it didn't quite happen. Tell us a little bit about that. Oh yeah, that's a good, a good story. Um, uh, when I left school, I was 16, this is in Coventry, I'm from Coventry, uh, I went along to Jaguar for an interview. There was, uh, they were taking on, I think, 15 apprentices. And, of course, you can imagine, there was a big queue of young lads queuing up to uh, uh, hopefully uh, fill, uh, fill these 15 spots. And uh, we had to have a little exam test. And the test, unfortunately, was only maths and nothing else. That wasn't my greatest subject. I was pretty good at all the other things. Uh, the result was I didn't get the apprenticeship there. But years later... I got the job of designing the Le Mans car, which was like the cream on the cake. And I remember saying to John Egan, I told him the story, and he thought it was good. But anyway, I got rejected first time round, but I was okay second time round. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been a, a nice feeling when uh, Roger Silman called you that day and asked you to come on board, uh, knowing that was in your background. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, well, Roger, of course, I knew from all. Uh, we'd been together in uh, Formula 1 and Formula 2 and things. And uh, he phoned up and he said, would I be interested in designing this uh, Le Mans car for TWR uh, Jaguar? And it took me about a millisecond to say yes, because um, uh, obviously 
Jaguar, for, from my point of view, being a Coventry lad, was like a, a super icon. So no hesitation. That was a, a great, uh, a very simple decision. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the various iterations of the Group C cars that you worked on. The, the changes were subtle from the XJ6 through to the 40, XJR6 through to the XJR14. Uh, tell us the, the sort of um, at the DNA moved, what changed and what and what changed the cars as they progressed. Uh, well, if you look at the very first car, uh, it was originally painted in green, uh, and green and white, because you then the the uh, Silk Cut sponsorship in those days, right at the very beginning. Uh, if you look at that and look at the right at then the latest car, they're similar. There's a, fa a very strong family resemblance, and several reasons for that is uh, one is things like uh, um, the structure of the car, which is a car, uh, which is carbon fibre, and it was a complete monocoque. That means what you see is the is the monocoque, the structure. It's like a road car. Uh, and you just take the nose and the tail off and the rest is uh, just carbon fibre. Uh, it's very expensive to produce and, and, and uh, uh, because of the tooling, etc. So that once you've committed, you're stuck with it, really, unless you're very, very wealthy. So it only changed uh, subtly over the years. And the other thing was the windscreen, because making a windscreen was a pain in the neck. Uh, and uh, so once you got a, a shape that was acceptable, he tended to stick with it. So those areas dominated the center section of the car. What really changed was the, the underside, uh, the tail, the nose, and the wings. And there was massive, uh, massive development over those years um, at Imperial College, where I used to do all the wind tunnel testing, uh, to, uh, to produce one, a sprint, what we refer to as a sprint configuration. That means a high downforce. Uh, uh, aerodynamic package where you're not worried about uh, the drag so much because the straightaway speeds were relatively slow. And then Le Mans, which was the total opposite, where it was all about straightaway speed. And so you needed two completely different body packages. So it was like making two cars, although the bits had to be sort of interchangeable. And if you look at the first car, it used to have a sort of long tail, a funny shaped tail, which in those days, all the cars, the Le Mans cars, had long tails. This was the German influence. They, they assumed you've got to have a long tail. But I found, eventually found that we could achieve what we wanted without it, just a very short one, which made it look very different, uh, say, to the Porsches and what have you. And actually, it was superior as well. <laughs> I put a massive effort in, in, uh, in getting the car down the straight to do 240 miles an hour as... Uh, uh, as we did actually achieve in 88, and that's how we could actually overtake the Porsche on the straight, which was, from my point of view, that I'd won the race there and then just by overtaking them on the straight. <laughs> but it, it, that was, uh, it was a massive development to arrive at that stage. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't simple. And of course, I show a picture here of uh, the Klaus Ludwig Porsche uh, with the two uh, Jaguars down the Molsam Strait. Did you spend a lot of time bearing in mind that Porsche had basically ruled Le Mans for the best part of a decade at this point, had won race after race after race? Did you spend a lot of time studying Porsche, trying to find the weaknesses that you could build on? Uh, yes, well, uh, that's what designers do. Uh, before you can beat the opposition, you need, need to understand them and ideally understand their, or establish their weaknesses. And I looked at the Porsche, although it actually looks pretty impressive car and had won all these phenomenal races, it was stunningly reliable, which was uh, you know, a massive credit to them. But though it did have certain weaknesses, the structure was very flimsy, certainly by my standard, very flimsy structure, and it wasn't safe for the driver. Uh, it, uh, it was um, uh, a very small aluminium monocoque, whereas we had a complete carbon structure which is very safe so that it could protect the drivers because obviously when you're doing 24 hour races there's a good chance you might have a crash and if you do you've got to look after the driver and unfortunately the Porsche when it crashed it tended to just fall to pieces but so uh, the uh, that uh, that was uh, uh, one of the obvious things it, not only was it of course safe it was structurally very very stiff which meant then the suspension would work better and respond better and so that uh, people like Alistair could actually twiddle the knobs and it would actually do what you wanted. Uh, that, that was one main feature. The other, of course, was the ground effect. These were full ground effect cars and the, the, 
the Porsche was weak in that area because it had a flat engine, a flat uh, six engine, uh, which limited the size of the Venturi tunnels underneath the back of the car, whereas with the Jaguar V12, I know it's a, even though it was a, just a production engine, really, they'd been super modified and made incredibly reliable, uh, considering you've got 740 horsepower by Allen here, the, it was narrow, it's a very narrow engine, and so you could get very large uh, uh, Venturi tunnels, uh, which immediately gave it a lot more downforce than a, a Porsche. And the only other thing after that was then to reduce the drag to get it down the straight, and which after m months of fiddling around over, and years actually, uh, at Imperial College, uh, in, we, I keep nibbling away, nibbling away, until eventually we could do all the, the, do the straightaway speeds we needed. And those are the basic uh, secrets. Well, of course, you mentioned there that it was the basic production engine, and, and Alan might like to give an insight on this as well. That is a fairly big engine to try and shoehorn into a Group C car, is it not? Uh, uh, yes. When I was, I was shown an engine, when I went to Tom's and they showed me the engine, uh, Tom said you can do anything you like as long as you use a Jaguar V12 engine. And I looked at this engine, I'd never seen an engine so big in all my life. Because race car engines, are not, no, genuine race engines, are quite small and compact. Or they're like only V8s or whatever, might even four cylinders. So this V12, it looked colossal. On top of that, it was very heavy. So I thought, oh, I realized straight away that the engine would dominate the car. The weight of the engine and the center of gravity of the engine was very high. So we had to work like hell to lighten it off, lower it down with super flat sumps and what have you. And I pushed the engine as far forward as I could so it nearly touched the driver's shoulder, recessing into the bulkhead to get the weight forward. And we ended up with uh, an acceptable um, weight distribution, which was, of course, in car is critical. It must have uh, given you some challenges, Alan, to uh, have such a powerful engine squeezed into a car like that. And I can see you itching to say something. <laughs> Before Scotty answers that, you. 25 years, you know, 30 years have gone by, and there's Tony talking, and he's saying, yes, and it gave me the opportunity, you know, to sort of get rid of that long tail and go down the Molson straight at 241 miles an hour, and Scotty leant across to me. All these years later, the competition remains, because he said, it's because it had such a good engine. <laughs> I'll remind Tony that the first time he saw the engine, he said to me, you don't think you're going to win with that thing in the back? <laughs> Do you remember that? So with that encouragement... That's before it was, made. That's before it was changed, modified. <laughs> well, um, I suppose, to, I mean, I could go on for hours about that. The, the basic thing was we were racing against a supercharged small engine that everyone knew was the only way to go for efficiency. What people were forgetting was that the fuel regulations, as far as the type of fuel in the early days, was very open. The rule started at 105 octane and said nothing else. So we all know that the German folk are extremely good at uh, making things that sort of tend to go fairly well. So the next year came down in 1986, it came down to 102 octane. We were running engines around 13 and a half to 14 to 1 compression on a, on a conventional engine which needed a lot of technology with head gaskets and things to hold together. And Tom and I talked about the fact that the reason why we had a fuel consumption formula was because the world was starting to see that we were causing some problems with the planet and we were burning oil. So we put forward that the Group C for 1987 should have standard 1998 octane fuel. Porsche came back as a contra because they'd heard about uh, Tony's tunnels and things and they made us lower the tunnels. But they were fools. They should have left the fuel the way it was and left the tunnels as high. The minute that we got 98 octane in for 1987, we could run 13 to 1 compression ratio, which gives you horsepower and it gives you fuel economy. As I'm sure you know, 1987 was just a sea change. We went bang, bang. And the uh, Porsche folk had to run their turbocharged engines uh, on 98 octane. Their small 3.2 litre engine would just simply detonate if they ran with the correct ignition timing. So the work that we did later on with turbocharged engines was 
running a small engine with 98 octane, you had to retard the ignition around about six degrees from optimum. So by the time they started to retard their ignition to stop their engines from having detonation, that's how in 1987 uh, we went from six and a half litres to seven litres. We ran the engines uh, at a slightly lower RPM. There was nothing I could do over 6,800 EM to keep the fuel economy because there was just a huge number of things rotating, pistons, main bearings. And if we put a larger engine running it at lower RPM with high compression running at 98, that's when we hit the magic number in 1987. So we have a brilliantly designed car, we have a fantastically robust engine, all we need now is a strategy to take us to Le Mans in 1988. So Alistair, um, tell us about what the thinking was for you in the lead up to that race. What was the strategy at the time? Strategy is a word that um, really has come into being uh, quite recently. Um, people didn't used to think strategically about races. They um, basically kissed the driver goodbye on the start line and uh, greeted him again at the end of the race. The Group C racing, and especially Le Mans racing, gave the opportunity to be strategic because you could be part of that race. You could work on the pit road and in the pit lane to alter the, the course of the race. And that became what has, is now uh, regarded as strategy in, in all uh, uh, categories of racing. The strategy at Le Mans was really to get to the end because you race against the circuit itself rather than the competitors. Going around there as fast as you can for 24 hours without anybody on, else on the track is really hard to do correctly. You throw in another 50 odd people who get in your way and the, the strategy becomes much more difficult to do. Add to Group C, as Alan has explained, you had to run the car to a certain amount of fuel. Now, to run it to the fuel, you had to know how far you were going to go. Well, you didn't know how far you were going to go, go because the conditions would always change, things would get in the way, so you had to allocate the fuel in, in an hourly basis. So we would run an, an amount of fuel, we were given 2,500 litres, I think, to do the 24 hours. So we were allowed just over 100 litres of fuel per hour in the car. So the strategy was to use that most efficiently. And Le Mans is all about average speed. You've probably been overtaken by an Arctic truck on the motorway when you've stopped for fuel and you've been belting up there for three or four hours you get out of the fuel station and there goes the truck that pa you passed three hours ago while he's just been plodding along. And you've been going 30 miles an hour quicker than him and yet you stop for five minutes to fill up, have a leak, and there he is right with you again. Well, the same applies at Le Mans. It's the time you spend stopped that's the real killer. Going round and round at a reasonable speed will get you to the end a lot quicker than stopping a lot. So it's the time lost in the pits that is the real big gain. So you try and minimize that completely. And that's what we tried to do. We tried to keep the pits clear at all times and keep the cars out running on the circuit and running to the fuel, not yo-yoing up and down uh, like the Porsches tended to do with their uh, turbocharged engines, which they could turn up, go very quickly for a little while, and then think, ooh, we've got to bring that back because we won't get to the end. Uh, Alan, Zytek and myself, we'd uh, worked out a method of letting the drivers know exactly the fuel they were using instead of a fuel gauge which goes to empty, you come into the pits. We let them know on a lap-to-lap -lap basis whether they were running to the fuel or not. So they could see and adjust their driving styles so that they would be using precisely the right amount of fuel as it would come up with laps worth of fuel used. So at each crossing of the finish line, there would be a number on the dashboard which would match their pit board, say three laps, four laps and so on. And the clever drivers amongst uh, us would know that if that, uh, if that no number changed before or after that, a specific point, that they were either above or below the fuel. And of course, they always worked out that a car fat with fuel was actually not as good at fuel consumption, but when the car was lighter, they could actually bring it back a bit. 
So they will be able to use that in the car, that information, to regulate their race and go at the optimised pace to use the fuel at the correct rate. Well, we'll explore some of the stories that unfolded with that strategy during the race itself uh, in a little bit. But uh, let's talk to Andy Wallace now, and let's begin, Andy, at the very start of your racing career, where you bought your first racing car from a Scotsman in a lay-by. Tell us all about it. <laughs> well, do you know what? I have no idea how you knew that story. Um, but it, it's true. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I... Um, I wanted to race cars, but I didn't have any money. And I wasn't particularly good at school. Um, I was good at maths, actually, so I probably could have helped you, Tony. Um, but I was crazy, crazy keen about going racing. So um, karting, the, the thought of going karting came up. And actually, I thought, it's probably different now, but I thought, well, if I did karting and spent money doing that, you still got to start in racing cars um, later on. So I just went round all the racetracks and followed a particular series. It was called the pre-1974 Formula Ford Championship back in the day. So in, in 70, yeah, pre-74, this was in 1979. I went round to every race, um, clocked what sort of times everybody was doing, and also looked at which of the cars were close to the front. And I thought a Hawk DL11 seemed to be a car that, would, that could do the job. So I found one in Scotland and the guy who was selling it had one of those um, coaches that he'd sawn the back doors off, which you used to see those all the time, didn't you? But you don't see them anymore. I think insurance killed those off. I think you couldn't all get the them Italian in. Job. All the Italian <laughs> job, yeah. So the, the, the back of the doors opened and the car went in. And then in the, inside the coach itself, you left about 10 seats in there. So it's nice and civilized for meetings and things. And the rest you converted to beds and stuff. So I managed to say to this guy, look, can we meet about halfway? And it was just outside Alton Park in the Sandback Services on the M6. So he drove down, I, I drove up, met the guy, we opened the doors, we dragged this Formula Ford off the back of the truck, fired it up, and I drove around the service area. I mean, I can imagine doing that now, right? In a Formula Ford car. God, blimey, you wouldn't get halfway around, would you? And you'd be gone, locked away somewhere. So came back, and it all seemed to be working. I had absolutely no idea what I was looking at but um, I desperately wanted to go racing, so he wanted 1,250 quid for this car. So I'd come ready with my 10 pound notes and I counted them all out, got to 1,250. I was dressed quite scruffily and I was starving hungry. And even though he was a Scot, as our dear Mr. Walkershaw was, of course, um, he said, here, here's 10 quid back, get yourself some breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it, I, got, I, I, I bought the car and it was, um, yeah, you know, that was the easy bit, I suppose. And after that, it got a lot more complicated. <laughs> well, of course, it got very complicated in 1986 when you won the British F3 Championship. Um, this is, don't forget, only two years before he arrives at uh, TWR to win Le Mans. At that point, though, in single seaters, you've just got that F3 Championship under your belt. Were sports cars on your radar at all at that point? Well, I, I have to, embarrassingly enough, I have to say it wasn't. I mean, I had seen quite a lot of sports car races. I remember sitting with my dad in the grandstands at Silverstone, uh, watching one of the six-hour events, and just logging down the, the lap chart. And I was really into it all. But having won the F3 Championship, all of the drivers that had done that in the years previous had landed in Formula One. So who was, um, who was 85? Who won? Oh, Maurizio Guzman. So before that, Johnny Dumfries. Before that, yeah, you can carry on. Um, Ayrton Senna, whatever. So I won that championship. Then at the end of the year, you have the Macau Grand Prix, which is uh, a big, massive punch-up for Formula 3 cars um, in Macau. And it was the top drivers from the French, German, Italian, American, Japanese, and British championship. And quite often, the, the runners from the UK would actually be at the front because I think it was the strongest championship of, of all the um, country's series. Went down to Macau and actually won that race as well with Jan Lammers and had a fantastic race with Jan Lammers. If you've got that footage, I'll be very impressed to see. Anyway, um, so at the end of all that, I thought, well, that's it. I've won the British F3. I'll just do Formula One. So I knocked on most of the Formula One uh, team's doors, um, got shooed away from some of them, but some of them invited me in. And um, I was offered two drives, um, Arrows and Tyrrell, actually, but all they needed was $600,000 and I can drive oh, a car. That's fine. Now, if they'd have said $6,000, I'd have had absolutely no hope. And then I realized, well, that's pretty much it. I, I mean, I, there was, it, was, it was such a struggle to actually get to that level in Formula 3. 
and had various people helping me, and there was absolutely no way of raising any more money. So at that point, I started to realise that maybe this is going to be a slippery slope to the bottom and end of. But of course they say it's not what you know in motorsport, it's who you know. But in your case, it was kind of a bit of it's who you bump into on an F3 round. Um, how did you first meet Jan Lammers in such a uh, scenario? <laughs> Tell us about that story. And we're really good friends now and um, we see each other sometimes. I wish it was more actually. He's a, he's a great guy. Um, yes, we were doing the, the race down in Macau and I think we bumped into each other in the paddock or whatever. But... It's, it's run in two heats um, and then the scores are put together because a Formula 3 car can only run 45 minutes on a tank of fuel. So during the first race, he was leading pretty much the whole race and I was chasing after him in second place. And the last place to pass was the Lisboa corner at the end of the long straight, which is a right-hand corner. Very, very wide straight. You arrive at well over 160 miles an hour in a little Formula 3 car. And then there's this tight right-hand corner. And then after that, it's pretty narrow all the way back. So Jan knew on the last lap, this is the place where I, I would have the last chance to pass him. I was all over the back of him like a rash, but I just couldn't find a way past. And Jan has the best car control of anybody I've ever met. However, on this occasion, looking in the mirror and seeing me, he just left the braking probably half a metre too late. Managed to lock up the rears, I think he touched the white line too, and he had this massive tank slapper on, trying not to crash. He, he wouldn't give up, and actually he got the car to go mostly into the corner, but now he was heading headfirst for the apex barrier. And he was going to hit it, absolutely no, no question. So I saw my chance, dived down the inside of him, and, and quite helpfully bumped his front wheels, back wheels and front wheels again, knocked him straight, and passed him. So we were in the same position, both running, both healthy cars. Now I was leading, he was second. And he chased me all the way around to the finish line, but couldn't catch me. Uh, the second race, the light went green and I cleared off. And so on the podium, uh, we were together. And he was like, oh, that was fantastic. Thanks for that. I was going in the wall for sure. But it just happened, um, you know, as fate happens this way sometimes. He was driving for TWR Jaguar. And they needed an extra driver. So... Um, some things went around and around, and I ended up getting a, a call from Roger Silman. Would you like to drive for Jaguar at Le Mans? And, uh, of course, the first caller you turned down, I understand, because you were still very much focused on single-seaters, but in the end, you ended up at Paul Ricard for the first test. Describe that day for us. Yeah, which I just came back from yesterday, oddly enough. So it's, things go around in circles. Yeah, I was invited down to Paul Ricard. There was... Um, he had a couple of sprint cars, I think, and a, and a, and a low downforce car there doing some development testing. And I, I don't think I was the only one. There were a few drivers invited down, um, basically just to have a look at what you could do. The trouble for me was I'd driven a Formula 3000 car by this time, but I hadn't driven anything really much faster or at all. And, of course, Jan was there, and he took me to one side, and he said, listen, um, it's going to be a bit of a shock when you drive this car. These are really, really quick cars. They're quite big compared with what you're used to. Um, this is what's going to happen, and this is how you, you work with it. And um, it was really, really helpful, what he told me. Also, it's strange, because when you're in single-seaters, you, you have to be a very selfish person if you want to get on. Uh, you don't trust anybody, particularly your teammate or anybody else in the paddock. So the fact that he was actually giving me information which turned out to be true really impressed me a lot. So anyway, off I set in this, um, in the, in the uh, Le Mans specification car and he was absolutely right. You go down the long straight and this car is just accelerating and accelerating and accelerating and um, which is the fault of actually all three of you, I, su I suppose. You set the car up. You made it have uh, no drag at all with lots of downforce. And then Scotty made it go really fast. So this car just kept accelerating and accelerating. It was, uh, I, was, I mean, as a racing driver, you shouldn't be afraid in a car. But this thing just didn't stop accelerating. And um, Jan did warn me that it was going to move around a lot. He, he, I think he said to me, it's like a caravan in a crosswind. And uh, he said, um, and that wasn't anything to do with your um, aerodynamics, Tony. It's... Um, <laughs> The, the main straight um, in Port Ricard is called the Mistral Strait because the wind howls down that strait off the, off the ocean. And the car does get blown around a lot. And Jan just said, look, just go with it, let it do its thing, you'll be okay, just keep your foot down. So in the end, I think the lap times were pretty good. 
then, um, later on, I think it was Tom said to me, right, okay, you can do a fast lap time, that's great. Let's see how you are over a period of time. So stuffed me in the car, slammed the door shut, filled it with fuel, and he said, right, we'll see you in an hour. So I thought, ah, I know what I've got to do here. I've got to use myself up so there's nothing left, and when I come back after an hour, all the lap times are quick, and he's going to be really impressed, he's going to offer me a job. That worked halfway. When I came into the pits, I opened the door to jump out. He's like, what, what are you doing? Uh-uh, fuel nozzle back on, second hour. By which time I was absolutely <laughs> toasted. Uh, but I did manage to get to the end, didn't uh, make any mistakes, and then I was invited to go to his office in Kidlington on the Monday morning, which I did. Well, of course, in those days, you didn't have, unlike now, a lot of pre-race testing for Le Mans. So you really just turned up having only seen the circuit as a spectator, didn't you? Well, yeah. In fact, there was a test day most years, but in 88 there wasn't. And I think that was because there was a resurface on, on the straight, yes. So no test day. So it was cold turkey. So, again, um, Johnny and Jan were, were incredibly helpful. And I think... At the time, I was thinking, well, that's really kind of them to be so helpful to me. But obviously, they were so petrified that the idiot new boy was going to be the one who binned it for them and, and, and lost them Le Mans. So that it was in their interest to make sure I knew what I was doing. So um, we went round in a um, Jaguar car. We, we, we went round on foot. I mean, it's a long way round on foot. Have you any idea how long that takes? And we just looked at every single curb, piece of grass, rock, hole in the road. This is what you've got to do. This is where you have to watch out this is where you might crash um, and also this is where you can save a little bit of fuel for absolutely no lap time or very very small amount of lap time so after all that um, I've got it all in my mind I didn't sleep the night before the first session I just was putting this all over and over in my head but nothing absolutely nothing will prepare you for coming onto the mall sand straight popping it into top gear holding your foot down and the car never stops accelerating. You're willing it to stop accelerating, and it will not. It just goes faster and faster and faster and faster. Very, very good bit of um, aero work there, and a very nice piece of engine work, Scotty. So, um, so actually what I did, there's no speedo, or there were no speedos in racing cars in those days, so I looked at the um, gear chart, and I roughly saw where 200 miles an hour was. So the first time down the straight, I just actually got it to 200 miles an hour, lifted off, and I thought that this will do nicely. <coughs> Excuse me. So there I am, going along at 200 miles an hour. You don't expect anything much to happen, and certainly nothing to come past you that quickly. A Mercedes and a Jag came past me like I was tied to a post halfway down the straight, and I thought, oh my goodness me, okay, it's not going to be fast enough. So the next lap, of course, you, you just pin the throttle. And in fact, what is it, three and a half miles down that straight and it takes 50 seconds to get from one end to the other. It's absolutely staggering how fast the car is. Of course, in the days when there were no chicanes on the Molesound straight, so you were flat out for the entire length of it. Um, well, flat out when you managed the Molesound kink, of course. And just about, I've had the pleasure of interviewing quite a number of Le Mans drivers over the years, including Derek Bell, who said exactly the same thing when he first went there. That Molesound kink was the thing he had to build his bravery up towards doing. Yes, and, um, and interestingly enough, this is where <laughs> Tony was very helpful, because I was a little bit, you know, you, you're arriving at the kink so fast, and you can't see the other side of it. It's, it's tight enough that you don't see around it, and it's flat out. You have to go flat out if you want to win Le Mans. And Tony said to me, look, no, 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 listen, listen, you've got so much downforce on this car. When you get to there, it can't possibly move. Just, just turn the wheel, you'll be fine. And then we had a little bit longer conversation. And then he said, listen, and, and you always did it in how many Ford Granadas were balancing on the roof. <laughs> and, um, and I was going down the straight thinking, well, it's going to be fine. It's going to be grippy because it's got these Ford Granadas balancing on the roof. And then I thought to myself, well, I just hope they don't fall off. <laughs> but he was absolutely right, of course. And even if it was raining, the Molsheim kink is completely flat out. And we're talking about 240 miles an hour. And, and actually, I remember coming there, it, it wasn't so much that you turn the steering wheel to go through the kink, you basically just move your elbow, and the next thing, whoosh, you're straight through the corner. It was, well, it was frightening, frankly. Well, of course, 240 mile an hour uh, is a lot of force on any vehicle, especially with the, the downforce that uh, Tony had managed to achieve with that design. 
tell us someone about the, um, the problems that caused you that year with the tyres, because of course these are speeds that tyre manufacturers just weren't really used to doing at this point. I mean, uh, it, it, uh, if you haven't got fed up on my voice already, this is quite a topical <laughs> thing because I, yeah. I do a little bit of work with Bugatti and the, the car has a, a top speed of who knows what, we haven't done it yet, but it's limited to 261 miles an hour purely because of the tyres. And in fact, the, the, those tyres, if you, if you were able to do that even 261, after about eight or nine minutes, they would all explode. So as a safety feature on the Bugatti, actually, it runs out of fuel in six minutes and 47 seconds, so <laughs> it doesn't matter. But, um, but this is 2019, yeah. so it hasn't really changed much. Around about the sort of, I don't know, 230, 240, 250, that's where a radial tyre is happy, and any more it's not. So in the case of, I'm sorry, if I'm talking over you guys, nick the microphone, but um, we were using a radial tyre all year um, with, the, with the car, and Dunlop were not happy with us going there with this tyre. They said, no, you've got to go back to the cross-ply tyre, because at least we know that that should have a, a bigger headroom. And in fact, that's what we did. Now, the only unfortunate thing is, if a radio explodes, generally what happens is the sidewall um, fails, and it's possible that the tyre could stay on the rim. It's probably not going to be very nice at that speed, but you've got some chance. When a cross-ply fails, it actually unravels and you probably all remember seeing Gilles Villeneuve that time at, in the Ferrari, I think it was a 3-1-2 at Silverstone when he had a puncture, and he's got this tail flying around smashing all the car to pieces. Well, on, when, as soon as, the, as soon as the tire fails, probably the second revolution with a, with a tail, it then takes off that rear wing that you see behind the car, and all of a sudden you're, you're airborne. So although the tires could, cake, uh, could cope with a bit higher speed, the penalty for a puncture was much worse. I mean, that's an incredible thing if you think about your own Jaguars parked out the front. If you're uh, an owner of a 40s, 50s or 60s Jaguar and you imagine 240 mile an hour on cross plies, it kind of blows your mind really. Um, uh, Tony, of course, um, you, you had an incident with Wynne Percy when a tyre had failed and Wynne Percy has, has famously said after that incident that he had that it was due to the rigid design of the car that he probably walked away with that, um, you know, fine. Is that something that you're conscious of as a designer, at designing for the safety of the drivers? Was that coming into the sport by then? Well, it certainly was with me. The, the, as I mentioned earlier, the, the carbon structure was engineered so that it gave a lot of protection to the driver, maximum protection you could get. Uh, it had very strong uh, rear bulkhead uh, and all the sides, as they were, uh, were complete structural members so that uh, they could uh, take tremendous impact and yet wind did have this uh, uh, very nasty moment when uh, a tyre uh, had just gone out from the pits I think it was the first lap wasn't it that, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he got on the Mulsanne straight got up to about 200 miles an hour and suddenly the car turned sideways uh, for no apparent reason and then went oh and then barrel rolled over and over uh, all the body and everything falls off and then it sort of stopped he said it all went quiet. He just went click with his seat belts and stepped out of it and walked, ran over to behind the armco. Well, normally, in the past, the, you'd have been in big trouble if that happened. It, certainly if you'd have been a Porsche, you'd have been dead. Um, but it transpired that the tyre delaminated. The whole tread had come off, a rear tyre, and it was a new one. I think following a pit stop must have been a suspect tyre, I don't know. Yeah, but it, it was a puncher, yeah. And it was right at the very beginning of his run, uh, and it, it threw the tread, which immediately knocks the tail off, as, uh, as uh, we were just saying, and then and the wing. And of course, once you knock the tail off and the wing, at 200 miles an hour, the car just turned sideways. Uh, but fortunately, uh, he, uh, he could walk away because it was such a very strong structure, which was, which was pleasing to me, and obviously very pleasing to, <laughs> to win. <laughs> Well, that kind, of, uh, that kind of accident, Andy, it just happens far too quickly in that particular moment. Um, you must have to put all thoughts of things like that out of your mind when you're sat on that grid waiting to start the 24 hours of Le Mans. It sat on the grid. It wasn't too difficult to, to, to put that out of my mind. But um, on that long run down the straight, it's so unusual to sit in a racing car with your foot buried on the throttle. If you think about it, I mean, most tracks, I think 10 seconds would be more than you would ever hold your foot flat down. So 
you're going down the straight it, every single lap, day and night, and um, you would have thought, yeah, you just put it to the back of your mind and don't think about it, but I didn't. I was thinking, well, now that would be very inconvenient if the tyre was to go bang. But um, luckily, um, these uh, gentlemen have fitted a, on top of the dash, next, which was part of the fuel computer, they had, um, we had some um, infrared heat spies that looked at the tyres, and it was measuring the outside, middle and inside temperature of the tyre. So if you get a slow puncture, this is the thing that's going to make the tyre fail. If you get a slow puncture, what you don't feel is anything wrong because the extra heat that's generated by the tyre because it's going down keeps the uh, air pressure up. So you don't feel anything but the temperature rises of the tyre and then of course it fails. So you've got these heat spies on all of the tyres and then there's a light on this computer on the dash and left, uh, left side tyres, right side tyres. If there was a fault or if there was a, an over temperature, the light, the, the switch itself would flash. And if you push that button on the switch, you can read the temperatures all the way across that tyre. So I'd be going down the straight, well, not every lap, but some laps, and I'd think to myself, well, I wonder if the bulb's broken. <laughs> Maybe the bulb's broken. You know, and it's, you know, it's funny and you, you laugh, and it, it, it is funny, but actually it's quite serious because you, you're sitting there. I mean, the car's fantastic, everything's great, but we're doing something that really, the, I mean, the tyres were designed for it, yes, but they're not, they're not happy going that fast for that long. So yeah, what if the bulb's broken? So press the button, read it, no, 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 it's fine. Dun, 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 dun. So I go around all four, carry on down the straight, and then I think, well, I wonder if the bulb's broken now. <laughs> and then press them again, and I, yeah, I'm, I admit it, I put, look, I don't race anymore, so I can put my hand up and say that, because if you were a current driver and you said that, I don't think anybody would hire you. <laughs> I think everyone who's ever dreamt of being a racing driver, and especially anyone who's ever uh, fancied uh, to go into Le Mans and, and drive in a car, always wants to hear about one thing, and that is, what is it like at night? Try and take everyone in the room that sat here to that moment where you jump in for your night stint, You've got to take on Mulsanne, and you've got to find Mulsanne corner, which I'm guessing for you was a first, second gear corner in those days. You've got to pick that out in the gloom and the darkness before, ladies and gentlemen, remember, they floodlit the corners like they do now. Take us all through that experience. Right, well, the first thing is it's dark, and it's really, really dark. Um, and I remember going to watch the race several times with my dad on a Page and Moy 35 pound coach trip. And if you crept through the trees, you could stand and watch the cars go by, fascinating, hairs standing up on the back of your neck, but it's really dark until the next car comes across. So the next thing, if you look at the, the picture on the wall there, look how low the lights are set in the car. I mean, I have no idea whose idea that was. That's a very silly idea because um, you can't get any distance on the lights. You know, if you, if you tip the, the light up to get a bit of distance, you just shine in the sky. And then you tip it down till it hits the road in front, and you're basically from here to that wall. So you can't see anything. Um, I know why you did it, Tony. There's a wheel in the way, and there's lots of other things. But it would have been very helpful if it was further up, so it wasn't. Um, on top of that, these are just normal sort of halogen bulbs that nobody uses anymore, so they're not that bright anyway. And then you, you think about it, we were um, what, over 100 metres per second, top speed. 100 metres per second is 360 kilometres. Yeah, we were faster than that. So very, very fast. It's coming at you. You can't possibly use the lights to see where you're going. So you need to have a, um, a database of things that you know to look for. As, as you go around and basically mentally tick them off. This is if you're on your own, of course. If you've got cars ahead, you can, you can see where it's going. But if you're on your own, yeah, you can, okay, there's that signpost, there's that restaurant, there's that, there's that, there's that, so that you know exactly where you are because the lights are not really helping you very much. Um, yes, you've done some running in the daytime before it gets dark, so you've also got that data to work on, but there's nothing like being able to be, you know, millimetre perfect, uh, which is quite difficult when it's dark. And of course, on top of all of that, you've got slower traffic as well that you have to judge the speed of. And judging the speed of another car must be really difficult in the dark with those kind of closing speeds. It's very difficult. And if um, I've, I've actually raced at Le Mans in an LMP2 car as well. And I can tell you that when, when a faster car is coming with the lights on, you can see they're there, but you've no idea how far they are behind you. They've, there's no perception of this distance. So it's very difficult for the slow cars to see 
um, who's coming and how close they are, firstly. Um, I think the thing you're referring to is um, the two lines on the straight, and, and this happened day or, or night, you've got the two lines, and you might have a, a, a slower car in front that's going perhaps 170 miles an hour, and you're catching quite quickly. As you get closer to this car, you realise it's two cars, and then the, the one behind pulls out to pass the one in front, and you're coming. So now the two lanes are blocked. But luckily, <coughs> excuse me, it's like this. So you've got a gap that you could fit through, only you are doing 240 miles an hour. But as you get closer and closer and closer, this gap is getting smaller, and you've got to make a choice. Um, can I make it through there, or do I have to lift? Now, working for Tom Walkinshaw, if you lift on the straight and you bin three seconds, you're not driving for Tom Walkinshaw for very long. So you've got this in the back of your mind. Yes, it's an endurance race, but you cannot lift. You cannot lift. You'll lose, you'll lose too much time. So you keep your foot buried in. You squeeze through this gap, and after you've done it, you promise yourself you'll never do that again. It was horrendous. And, of course, three laps later, you do the same thing again. Now, in the dark, that just becomes even more difficult. Um, some of the slower cars got used to us in the end, and then when we arrived, they just would cower on the hard shoulder and get out of the way, which was the best course of action, I think. Well, I did hear a memory from uh, my dad, actually, who's here in the audience, of uh, him sat in the uh, tribunes, you know, at sort of three in the morning, and a car had spun on the, uh, the pit straight there, and uh, you and the sister Jaguar split and went either side of them. And the, the amazing view that uh, the spectator gets of that split second decision decision you guys are having to make with slower traffic um, is something quite incredible. Um, let's talk about the beginning of the race in 1988 and Alistair you were on the pit wall at that point no doubt. Were you as the team was sort of getting ready to start the race aware of the pressure that was building from the spectators that were there or was it just a case of focusing on your job in hand? I think we were aware of the pressure. Um, Tom had always promised a three-year uh, strategy to, to win Le Mans. This was year three. Um, so this was, come on, guys, get on with it. We, we've had a couple of practices. We should, uh, we should really perform this time. So, yes, there was some pressure. I, I've felt more pressure at different times to win Le Mans um, because later I would stand there when the CEO of another company had announced that they were going to win that Le Mans that year. And that does put you under more pressure. But 88 was, was enough pressure. But I think we were ready for it. We were lucky to some degree, but we were ready. There was enough pressure to keep us all um, completely focused. And um, we were aware that uh, the uh, crowd were going more and more uh, Jaguar biased as the, as the race came on. Uh, there was more Jaguar fans appearing until they became what I can only describe as a football crowd towards the end of the race. And I've never seen at any race uh, an audience, crowd, enthusiast behave in the way at a motorsport event that they did at that day in 88. And there was an incredible moment when there were uh, the Porsche that was giving you probably the most trouble during the early stages of the race, driven by Klaus Ludwig at the time, that car you see behind us. Um, their reserve fuel pump had failed and he was bringing it into the pits on the starter motor. Was there ever a glimmer in your mind at that point where you thought, mm, well, this is good news for us? Or do you dare not think like that? <laughs> I think we always assumed it's a game of snake and ladders at, at Le Mans. You, you, you're up one minute and down the next minute, and you, there was five cars there, and each one of them would run into some form of problem in exactly the same way that the opposition would. And it was literally snakes and ladders throughout the race, and you were never really sure that you weren't going to step on a snake <laughs> at any point during the race. <laughs> well, about 40 minutes to go, yes, we did step on a big snake, didn't we? Oh, yeah. Well, yes, let's talk about that snake. And it came in the form of a gearbox, of course. And uh, one of the uh, other cars that uh, was in the team at the time, I think it was the Bozel car, had come out earlier on in the, in the race due to a gearbox problem. Now, Andy, I understand Jan Lammers had said to you at the beginning, this is not our race because that gearbox is going to let us down. But you had devised a strategy as drivers to get around it, hadn't you? 
Yeah, so, so after getting the position in the team and we walking around the track and everything, we then went back to the motorhome, or the, actually, motorhome, that sounds so grand, it was a caravan, a little tiny caravan, um, with, with in, during the night with a big dog underneath, a big mean dog to stop people coming in. But he, he didn't realise that we were friendly, he used to bark at us too. But um, anyway, so Jan said to us, look, um, we're actually going to lose this race, and the reason we're going to lose is because the gearbox is going to fail, that's it. And then he stopped talking. So I thought, well, oh, um, this is not good. And then he said, well, hang on, there is a solution perhaps, but we're going to have to be very, very disciplined and we're going to have to agree all between us that we eliminate some gear changes around the lap. So this third gear corner, we can take it in fourth and we'll lose almost nothing. And we did that all around the lap and I'm not sure how many gear changes we eliminated per lap, but it made a difference. And then the other thing is how hard you go on and off the throttle and put all that strain through the drivetrain, let's just roll into the throttle, keep squeezing it down, but just roll into it and try and keep off the kerbs, particularly if you've got your foot on the throttle. So we all said to each other, right, okay, we're in, we're gonna do that. And if I think one of us had not followed that code, we perhaps wouldn't have got to the end. Well, of course, you, Jan Lammers did finish in fourth gear. Alistair, was this something you were aware of on the pit wall at the time, that uh, he was nursing the car home? And was that photo finish really a photo finish, or were they there to push him across the line? Come on, tell us how it happened. The uh, finish at the moment was, was quite dramatic, but very few people knew about it. Um, Jan radioed in about 40 minutes to go, saying he'd got a, tr uh, a problem. He was asked to elaborate and wouldn't. Um, he came in for a final pit stop in fourth gear and left the pits in fourth gear for that final pit stop. And if you can imagine, it's a 200 mile an hour fourth gear. It's not just your normal fourth gear. That was a very tall order and a lot of clutch slipping very gently to get it out of the pits. Um, we were very, very pleased perhaps that we didn't know the full story until after the race because we were already nervous enough, but if we'd known the full extent of the damage or p uh, uh, possible damage to the car, w we'd have collapsed. But um, Jan managed to keep it a secret from the rest of the team uh, and only admitted what he'd done later in the, uh, in the day when, uh, when the race was won. Uh, his thoughts behind that was that if he'd said on the, uh, the radio that uh, we were in trouble, then obviously Porsche would get to hear about it, they would put more pressure on us, and uh, we could break it. Why were the cars lined up behind him? Well, Tom had told the other drivers to get behind Lammers, and if there was uh, a problem with the car, they were literally to push the car over the line. They weren't there for the formation finish you saw on the, the photo there, they were there in a job of work to be breakdown trucks and push that car across the line. It didn't happen, fortunately, because it would have been very, very awkward, but... Yeah. Alan, suppose... as an engineer, you must be sat there absolutely on the edge of your seat at this moment. Um, yeah, just in addition to what was being done, and I think it's something that people haven't realised, on that last lap, you saw all the flag marshals waving all their flags. That included the yellow yellow caution being waved means you can't overtake. It would have been a very interesting thing if the car had finished on the last lap after all the flag marshals had waved the yellow flag. Uh, I was flat out with the book, opening up the book with all the people screaming and yelling and I was told to get on and enjoy it. But it's an interesting concept that Le Mans has won the lap before the finish because the flag marshals wave all those flags. I'd like to just perhaps um, do a little bit more on the engine side of things uh, for Le Mans. The engines obviously had to run extremely lean. Uh, if you're technical, uh, the car was going down Mulsanne straight, wide open throttle, 14 to 1 air fuel ratio, which is the sort of air fuel ratio you cruise. Um, but one of the tricks we did with Zytec is we measured how often the throttle was wide open at Le Mans, and Andy, it's normally seven seconds that you then come off the throttle. Yeah. We found out that there was no time at Le Mans that the throttle was left open for more than seven seconds. Um, 
the Zytec guys were extremely clever. I went back with that situation. We came up with a timer. So we leaned the engines off so that they would be able to survive around the rest of the track. And once the throttle had been left open for more than eight seconds, we had a little trick in the software that flicked the mixture 4% richer. And that stopped the engine from melting all the way down the Mulsan. I then learnt to let the idle of the engines run very high, 1500 RPM. Every time they came off the throttle, the fuel was switched off. So every time the guys did a gear change and came off the throttle, the engine was idling quite quickly, but there was no fuel going in. So every time they came off, the car came off the throttle, it would be sucking cold air down through the engine and down the exhaust system to keep it cool. And that was, uh, we had in-car um, ignition and fuel adjustment. I went and checked what Honda were doing in 1985. They had a switch for two different maps in Formula One. But we were the first people to have in-car electronic control of mixture, which was a little dash mounted. It went from zero to five. So whenever there was a pace car, we put the thing right down to zero so the engine would hardly run. And if, if the fuel was okay, we would run around three out of five. When Alistair would tell me that we would have a problem, then we would click to two, and if we were desperate, we went to one. Um, but um, the tricks were high idle speed, uh, overrun fuel shut off, and then a timing device that when the car knew it was on the Mulsan straight, it richened just for the Mulsan. The minute they lifted off at the end of the Mulsan, it went back to the lean map. I'm going to bring in Richard West uh, now, just because what I want to do is just talk about the iconic livery of the car that won in both 88 and 1990, and they kind of get referred to now, I guess, as the Silk Cut Jaguars. Uh, but Richard, in 1988, you were working um, somewhere else. Were you aware of what had happened at Le Mans that year, and was suddenly Tom Walkinshaw someone you wanted to work with? Yeah, it was an interesting one. I'd, I'd been at McLaren since 84, a sponsorship coordinator, and Ron and I had a bit of a disagreement over strategy moving forward, and as he ran the company and I didn't, you know, my days were limited, and I, I thought, right, Will I go and work for another Formula One team? And I had several opportunities. And I went to a meeting in London, and I didn't know, but there was a FOCA meeting, as they used to be called, when all the F1 teams were there. And Flavio and Bernie and Ron and Ken Tyrrell and all those people were there. And sat in the reception of the hotel was Tom. And he, and he always called me Promo, because I worked in promotion work, nicknamed straight away. He says to me, what are you doing here, Promo? So I said, oh, I'm thinking about changing teams. And he said, what, in Formula One? I said, yeah. He said, well, why don't you come and work for me? So I said, doing what? He said, well, I want to change all the livery. I want a new PR strategy. We need to be doing more for Jaguar. We need to be doing much more for Silk Cut. Will you come and work for me? And I said, what's on the table? He said, I'll pay you twice of what you're earning now. And I said, it sounds good. He said, yeah, but you're going to work twice as hard for it. So I said, OK, fair enough. So we talked about it. And within a few minutes, we shook hands. And the people who I was there to see came out. And they said, we're ready now. And I said, well, I'm not. I'm sorry, I've gone to work for Tom. And literally, that was December, early December that year, after the F1 season had finished. And I started work at Kidlington. I said to Tom, you know, I'll see you on the second. And he said, why is that? I said, well, I thought the first was a bank holiday. He said, don't start. Be there on the first. And I went on the first. And we started. And within 14 days, I was in the States sourcing, but we also work very closely with the graphics company because the livery you saw there, the idea of that particular livery that was designed predominantly by Jaguar with input from Silk Cut, those yellow ears that went up above the headlights and everything were supposed to simulate, uh, they were supposed to look somewhat Jaguar. For the 89-90 season, we completely revamped everything. Um, Keith Partridge, who's here, was our transport manager. Keith was a great supporter of it. And we completely stripped everything back and we modernised the livery. Jaguar weren't pleased about it at the time. Um, but Silk Cup were ecstatic about it because it gave them more prominence. And the whole team underwent a transformation. We changed all the clothing, we changed the way we look. The caravan went, we introduced 
two brand new motorhomes. And in fact, at Le Mans in 89, the two motorhomes served up, I think, just under 6,000 meals in five days to the team and to the journalists and the sponsors and everybody that was there. So it was a complete revamp of the team, effectively. And this is something that is commonplace in racing teams now, but um, it was quite an operation that TWR ha uh, had with a number of people in the caravan, if you like, that sort of came along to the races to look after the drivers, uh, to look after the sponsorship and the PR. Um, every team does it now, but it was still relatively new in those days, wasn't it? It was in sports cars. I mean, I, I had, having had five years with Ron Dennis, I mean, Ron was always ahead of the game. You know, I mean, I have massive admiration for the guy because when everybody else still had a Winnebago, you know, Ron had a purpose-built motorhome. When everyone else had purpose-built motorhomes, Ron had a three-story building, you know. And I took some of that mentality with me. And Tom and Roger and Scotty, you know, were were very supportive. And they said, look, you know, we want to make this thing look right. And we took a quantum leap. Um, and we looked fantastic, but of course in 89 at Le Mans we got roundly trounced by Sauber, which, you know, I remember after walking out the circuit after the 89 race, and there were two Germans, a couple, who'd obviously had about 40 litres of beer each, and the girl had fallen face down in a muddy puddle, and there was just bubbles coming out the side of her, and Tom looked at me and he said, if she hadn't have been wearing a Jaguar T-shirt, he said, I'd leave her there to drown. And uh, we sort of walked out of the circuit together, and I always remember he said to me, this is not happening next year. He said, we're not going to get beaten like this next year. And it, I always said to people, you know, literally that walk out of the circuit in 89, didn't matter how well we looked, Tom already in his mind had going back to Le Mans in 1990 and being dominant. Mm -hmm. There are certain teams that when you look back have become iconic for their relationship with their sponsors. Uh, Bob Tullius managed it first with Group 44 and Quaker State, a relationship that lasted 18 odd years, almost unheard of at the time. And he was probably one of the first people in motorsport to really have that, that brand around his team, a recognisable set of colours and logos. Um, and if you think back to the Porsche 917s of 1970, everyone calls them the Golf Porsches. If you think of McLaren, it was Marlborough, um, and if you think of the, uh, the, the Porsches in the 80s, very synonymous with Rothmans. Um, I appreciate there's a lot of uh, tobacco advertising in there, but what do you think it is that makes some teams gel with the sponsors in such a way that they almost become inseparable from the car that they were stuck to, if you like? It's the attitude of the team principal. Tom was very similar to Ron in that respect. Ron was very clever in the heydays of McLaren, of weaving... I've always described it as like a fibre. He would, he would make sure it wasn't just branding on a car. He would be responsible for the hospitality programmes. He'd be responsible for their limited edition clothing. He'd run training days, all the things that I learned from him. So when a sponsor was that entrenched with a team, it was very, very hard for them to pull away and go somewhere else. And Tom was a very charismatic guy. Scotty and I were discussing this walking around the grounds earlier. He was a very, very good salesman, you know, and I, I've been in a number of meetings with him when he was actually presenting why you should be part of the TWR Jaguar squad. And it was just totally compelling because he was a force of nature, Tom. He went into a room, he had a great presence, he spoke very well, he was very forceful, he knew how to do a deal. And then what he would do, and I found this, I really enjoyed it with him, he would say to you as you came out of the room, right, there you go, get on with it. And at that point, then you had to go and make it happen. But Silk Cut Jaguar is still synonymous today, like Marlborough McLaren or Rothmans Williams was in the 90s, sadly up until we lost Ayrton, you know, it was very, very much in people's minds that they were integrated teams and TWR was, was a family of people that were very, very tightly integrated. And he must have been a tremendous negotiator as well. I, I'm reading in um, Alan's books there, um, which you, you really must get. I'm plugging them well for you, Alan. Um, uh, a little bit about the overlap between um, TWR preparing the Rover SD1s and the XJS in touring cars. Um, that would not be possible today, but somehow back then through negotiation, he managed to do that. Was that your experience of him as well? Yeah, very much. And <laughs> there was also a very humorous side to Tom. I'm jumping slightly ahead and I know we're very mindful of time. But when we won Le Mans in 1990, the winning number three car, we had an inquiry from Japan and uh, this chap phoned up and uh, spoke to me and he said, um, I have a customer, Japanese gentleman, he said, oh, I have a customer who wished to buy a Le Mans winning car. 
And I said to Tom, is it for sale? And he said, well, anything's for sale for a price, you know. He said, where are we at? And I said, what do you think it's worth? He said, mm, he said, if the man's got one and a half million quid, we could have a conversation. So I went back to this Japanese guy and I said, look, Mr. Walkinshaw's given me approval. The car is for sale in the condition that it finished Le Mans. And it's one and a half million pounds. Oh, okay. And then there was this long pause and he said, please ask Mr. Walkinshaw if a car comes with warranty. So there were certain times with Tom when you had to be a little bit careful. So I went back into his office. Guy was still hanging on the phone. And I said, Tom, it's going to be a really strange one. And please don't, you know, get out of shape with me on this. But the guy wants to know if it comes with a warranty. And he looked at me and he said, oh, it does, laddie. 24 hours or 4,000 kilometres, whichever comes first. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, we didn't sell the car. But no, he was a cracking negotiator. And it was, I, I went with him to do the Bridgestone deal for the XJR15 series and I'd been in other meetings with him for the Japanese sports car team with investors there and he was a sharp cookie, very sharp. And of course we see the uh, uh, pit lane behind us there with the, uh, the silk cut Jaguar team working on the car and you can just see from the overalls that they're using, the branding ran really strongly through the team. What I must just do is uh, put another picture up for you Richard because um, this is a story you can tell us about. Of course uh, after Le Mans had uh, given Jaguar success with TWO 1988, um, Andy, Jan, and uh, Johnny Dumfries, of course, had a hero's welcome back to Coventry in 1988. And what happened then, as I uh, shared with you early on, in order to follow the race in 1988, you had to watch Teletext, you had to have a shortwave radio. It was really quite difficult. Um, but by 1989, the mainstream media was starting to pick up on Le Mans. They were excited to show coverage of this British team in the race, of course. In 1989, it wasn't TWR's year, but in 1990, they came back fighting strong once again, um, Martin Brundle's car taking the win that year. Um, and just as in 1988, uh, where they had a, a, a hero's welcome through Coventry with a big parade and the whole town came out of work to wave at Andy and uh, congratulate him, uh, you went through a whole series of, of PR exercises to really maximise Jaguar's exposure following the win and this was one of them, wasn't it? Yeah, we, we, we set out to do an event a month for 12 months and in fact when we came back from Le Mans, uh, we set this up, this was at RAF Abingdon, and I, Andy King and I spent ages talking about this. We approached the RAF and we said, look, Jaguar fighter, any chance that we can do Jaguar versus Jaguar in a straight line speed test? And they said, yeah, we're up for that. And in America, we did the F-14, Tomcat versus Topcat. This was squadron leader Mike Lawrence and Brundle. And we went down to Abingdon and uh, with the world's assembled press there. And the idea was that the Jaguar was at the end of the, you know, 7,000 uh, metre runway. And the Jaguar aircraft was coming in full flaps, you know, with everything. But after two or three passes, we couldn't work out how we were supposed to signal Martin to say he's coming. Because, you know, these things don't hang about. They go over the top of you on full reheat. So in the end, we positioned Andy King down the far end of the runway in a road-going Jaguar. And his job was when he saw the Jaguar aircraft coming in on full flaps, just about to go on to reheat, he flashed his headlights like mad. And uh, Martin saw the headlights flash and drop the clutch and away we went. Andy said, you know, sitting there at the end of the runway with a 240 mile an hour Jaguar and a 700 mile an hour combat plane coming towards you, he said, the last thing I remember was seeing Brundle go past the side window and sort of the paint virtually peel off the top of his Jaguar road car as the reheat went over the top. So we did lots of stunts like that. We had the day in the life of a mechanic, day in the life of a truck driver. And they were remarkable events and they got a level of coverage for sports car racing that we ended up doing a television documentary that was based on showing how the British car industry didn't receive a tremendous amount of government support, whereas Porsche and Mercedes were receiving enormous amounts. So they were great programs, they took a lot to put together, but you see from that car the tidied up livery there. And in fact, that Le Mans car, two weeks after we won Le Mans with it, went to Monza and we put 13 journalists through it. And all it had really was a spanner check and a set of brake pads. And we put all these journalists in, we gave them three laps, one warming up lap, one flying lap, one slowing down lap. And at the end of the day, Brundle said to me, come on, Westy, you've never been in one of these, and squeezed my ample frame in a set of overalls. And he said, look, I'll be honest with you. He said, it's not for everybody, and I know you're a bit of a wuss. So he said, basically, I'll tell you the same as I tell everybody else. He said, when we start the flying lap, it will be quick. We go across the finish line at 190 miles an hour. He said, if at any time you don't like it, just put your hand up like that, and I'll back off, and we'll go back to the pits. Nine laps later, with me screaming, I said to him, what on earth happened? He said, sorry, I didn't see your hand. <laughs> 
Well, of course, it was a whole program of PR for Jaguar, of course, as well. It was very important that Jaguar sold cars on the back of the uh, partnership with TWR and the successes. When Jaguar started with TWR, they kind of gave them some money through the back door with the view that if it didn't go too well, then they wouldn't have to own up uh, to having been supporting it, and it was just a private team that messed it up. But of course, it did go well, and uh, by the time uh, Richard was in charge of the PR for it, of course, uh, at Jaguar were very much celebrating their successes. And it was a, a time, of course, where um, the late 80s had come, and uh, the world was in a massive economic boom, and what people really wanted to do was buy these racing cars for themselves, of course. And you could. The XJR15 was pretty much the XJR9, but based on a road car. And then, of course, came the world's fastest production car. And it was this, of course, the XJ220. Um, Alistair, perhaps you can... Um, just shed some light on the DNA that came through from the racing and the achievements there um, to the road cars, not just like the XJ220, but also the Jaguar Sport road cars as well. Tell us a little bit about how that progressed. The old phrase of uh, racing improves the breed was very much to the forefront of Jaguar going into producing uh, the 220 uh, with the combined might of Jaguar Sport, which was a Tom Walkinshaw and Jaguar joint project. Um, I'd looked at the original 220 prototype for Tom two years before he started working on the, on the real production 220 and said, well, basically, if we really want to build one of these to do what it's supposed to do, we'll have to start again. And so I then went back and, and well, played at racing cars again for the 1991, uh, the 1990 season uh, and was in charge of the, the Le Mans project there. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, uh, Tom and Roger put together a team of people to start designing uh, a car, one of which is Richard Owen, who designed the car standing over there. Um, and they were going to build, um, instead of a 12-cylinder four-wheel drive car, uh, a V6 Tur twin turbo car which would be small enough light enough for somebody to be able to build tires to hold the car up at at uh, its projected maximum speed of 220 miles an hour and that was the uh, the reason for its change between the show car that which Jaguar showed in 88 and its uh, eventual production uh, in V6 form which engine was a derivative of what we were then using in the Jaguar race cars. So there was a lot of synergy going between um, what was going on in the racing team and what was going on in that 220, not least of it. Tom decided that I should go over and uh, help develop the car from my nice comfy position in racing uh, to get involved in the production car world, from which I learned a great deal. And of course it was the fastest car in the world until a McLaren F1 beat the record, driven by... <laughs> <laughs> no, but actually what sticks in my mind is we, we were in Fort Stockton in Texas uh, with this car and we achieved, I think it was 217.1 two or something. And, uh, yeah, and, and I mean at the time that was uh, an unheard of speed. That was absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, the McLaren came along a little bit later on. I have really fond memories of your time at TWR. A um, couple of last questions before we wrap up, because the guys here are all waiting to go for their uh, barbecue with SNG Barrett very shortly. But um, just looking back, um, what was Tom Walkinshaw, as a very young driver as you were then, like to drive for? Was he scary? Was he supportive? What was the experience like? Um, probably a bit of both, actually. Uh, I think... He, he expected you to perform, and as long as you did, you were going to be okay. If you, at any stage, weren't performing, you knew you were in big trouble. And, uh, yeah, as a young driver, he, he scared the living daylights out of me, to be honest. Um, from negotiating in his office, um, you, you sort of felt that unless you um, asked him if you could have less money, you weren't going to get out alive. That was the first thing. Um, but also, I remember, you know, in those days, there were no pit lane speed limits. And when you think about that now, it seems crazy, doesn't it, that there wasn't. I mean, in Le Mans, it was self-regulating because the pits were full of 
every French person they could find just walking along in the middle of the race aimlessly in, in the way. So the, the pit speed was low. But somewhere like Daytona, for example, you could peel off the banking at close to 200 miles an hour into the pit lane, keep your foot in it, and we were always the last pit at Daytona. So you had the whole length of the pit lane, full throttle in top gear at 200 miles an hour. And we used to practice that. And I suppose that was a good idea to practice it, to, to, to know what you were doing. But, you know, if you, if you lifted halfway down the, <laughs> the pit lane, somebody would know, Tom would find out, and you'd be in trouble. And, um, and no, he was absolutely right. Also, the, um, the turbocharged, the V6 car, was very, very easy to stall. So each time you came in for a pit stop, even if it was one of the practice sessions, mm -hmm. the whole crew would be, Alistair and, and uh, Roger and Tom would be on the pit wall, looking at you, and of course that made it worse. It was, it was, it was easy enough to stall as it was, but with them looking at you, you knew you were going to stall the car. And um, so, but then, isn't that how you succeed? You have to be very, very tough on your people and expect and, and demand the best, and that way it lifts the performance of everything. So, yes, he was hard to work for, but um, he, he got the job done, didn't he? Well, you've won Le Mans since, of course, and uh, as recently as uh, the 2000s with the uh, LMP2 uh, uh, RML car that you, you won at Le Mans in, and, and, and you've had a fantastic glittering career ever since, but is there a little bit of you that still stays in 1988 at Le Mans on that special day? Well, you know, there's no doubt about that. You, you know, it's not every day you get to win Le Mans. Um, for me, it was just such an honour to be part of, of Jaguar and, and of TWR. It was incredible. And then to go there and win the race. Um, it also doesn't hurt your career any. So whatever came after that was thanks to TWR and thanks to Jaguar. And I'll never forget that. Absolutely. Mm. No way. And Tony, obviously, you went on to work uh, with all sorts of very successful racing cars afterwards as well. But looking back on those TWR days through modern eyes, what, if you could go back and tell yourself then to do differently, is there anything you'd do differently, or would it be just the same? Oh, that's difficult. I mean, uh, really, no, I wouldn't change the car because it was the limit of my knowledge and general knowledge for sports cars then. I mean, obviously, subsequently, companies I work for, we introduced things like pneumatic gear shifting and things like this so that the gearboxes didn't break. But of course that wasn't known then, we didn't consider it. So uh, uh, no, I'd have left it, I was quite happy, with it. I was very happy with the whole project to be quite honest. Alan, your, your thoughts to sum up your time with TWR as you look back, they were great engines weren't they? <laughs> yeah, um, I worked for 15 years and I think uh, I started when the teams were very very, uh, very small. I think I was number 12. I can't remember. How many were there, Paul? Yeah. So, um, Paul here. So, we probably saw a different Tom Walkinshaw. Um, but he certainly dragged us all up and up and up and up with him. So that I think we all performed better than we ever thought we would. Uh, and we went from a small team into a very public team. And, of course, that was very rewarding as well. Um, Engine-wise, if you ask me, looking back, would I have changed things? I would have changed the whole lot. <laughs> so, um, you're never happy. I mean, there's always something you can change. Um, especially after you've gone and spent £50,000 on camshafts or something, you know six weeks later you want to change it. So, um, it's not a bottomless pit. You've got to look in the future, you've got to make up specs, you've got to get your machining under control. And um, you've got to live with that and, and work with it. Um, people think that there was an endless supply of money, but you know there, there, there is just a certain amount of money. Talking about negotiating, it reminded me with my earlier negotiations with Tom um, on budgets, and I can remember putting in a 10% contingency. And he said to me, so some of your engines are going to blow up then. And I said, well, you know, it's a year. I, I don't really know. And he said, do you mean that we're not going to have total reliability? And of course, like a fool, I said yes. So he said, OK, we'll take the 10% contingency out. 
So that year, I remember we, we got the budget absolutely right. So when I presented next year's budget, he said, no one can be that good. He had another contingency built in. So the budget that I was presenting with no contingency got another 10% taken out. And you've just got to smile when you walk out the office and uh, get on with it. <laughs> well, I have to um, say a special thanks to Alan for sending me um, copies of his books here. Um, the two of them here, the, uh, the Guide to the XJS Group E, Group A era, and uh, the story of the Group C uh, prototypes. Um, they'll soon be available through the JEC shop. So if you've enjoyed the stories you've heard this evening, uh, do get hold of Alan's books because they are phenomenal. The amount of detail is incredible, right down to written slips with annotated notes on them. They, they really are something special. So uh, Alan, thank you for your help putting this evening together. And um, Richard, um, to sum up from you as well, what do you think the lasting legacy of TWR on the world of motorsport is even today? I think, you know, Andy touched very briefly on Daytona, and if you look at what Tom achieved in European touring cars, what then he achieved with Le Mans, in 1990 we dominated pretty much everything that had a sports car tag, you know, we were one, two in Daytona, I'm sure you remember that one pretty well as well, Andy, including me scorching across the forecourt and almost losing my job, but that's another story for later. Um, Tom contributed so much to what is now the car industry. If you think back, Ian Callum, you know, was working there up at Leefield. He had the clay room there. Tom had the virtual reality room that he built in. You know, did he go a step too far with arrows? Only history can really tell you that. But the truth of the matter was, he did things at a speed that other people just didn't contemplate at the time. And I think his legacy will be, when you look back at the TW Empire and what it was, I think you'll find very, very few people that would tell you that they weren't immensely proud of having worked for Tom and worked for that organisation. And again, you know, to have Martin here still representing the TWR brand out there and sp flying specially in tonight. She's back off to Monaco tomorrow morning to oversee what's going on there in Formula E. Legacy lives on, doesn't it? Well, let's uh, leave that then uh, with a reminder of the legacy that it left behind and let's just relive just before I do my final thanks and sum up uh, let's just relive the final moments of the last silk cut Jaguar TWR victory from 1990 so now the Jaguars are first and second and they've only got a little distance to go as the broken-hearted Jesus Perea walks back to the pits. Yes, a very sad end for Perea. This was going to be the race of his life. He's done little of note so far in motor racing, and this was just the sort of result he needed. Five minutes to four. Five minutes to go. A lot can happen in that time, but the tradition is that the marshals wave the flags to the victorious cars, and that is exactly what they're doing as the Jaguars are almost home. Yes, although this looks like the slowing down lap of a Grand Prix with all the flags waving, they, these cars are still actually on their last final racing lap. The race, of course, though, is now pretty much a foregone conclusion in terms of results, and the cars are really forming up to actually jockey for TV time to get their cars right at the front of the field so they can all cross the line with the leader. But none of them are being arrogant enough to pass the two Jaguars who proudly lead the procession, which is now, of course, going so much slower, home to the pit lane. A pit lane jammed with those 50,000 British spectators waving their flags, ready to greet their heroes home. They pour onto the track, and that means to say that the Jaguars and none of the others are going to be actually able to cross the line. And a final touch of irony as the leaders, who having kept off the curbs for the full 24 hours, now have to cross them having missed the pit entry lane, as they come up towards the Parc Fermé where the cars will be impounded. And it looks as though they're not even going to be able to get back to their pit, such as the onrush of the spectators. But it's a proud moment for everybody. Jaguar have achieved what they came for, victory at Le Mans, first and second.
the British crewed Porsche in third position and Derek Bell was in the crew of the Porsche which finished in fourth position. Nine laps behind the winning Jaguar. I'd like to say just a really special thank you to uh, Andy King who stood at the back of the room there uh, without whom none of tonight would have been possible. He has assembled all of these uh, fantastic TWR personnel for us, um, not just for tonight but also through Sunday at Blenheim as well. Um, also to, uh, to Patch, who's been doing all of the, uh, the sound and stuff at the back there. Um, Richard, there's people in the audience that you'd like to thank as well. Yes, I also think Andy was just giving me a thumbs up from the side there. I think also uh, Elizabeth Walkinshaw is here, and I think Fergus is here as well, Tom's son as well. So we really do have a full family compliment here tonight. So once again, to the Walkinshaw family and to the support and all the help that they've given everybody and the fun that we've all had together, um, a round of applause for them, please. I think it's justly deserved. <laughs> I'll end by saying that the reason we're all here is our passion for Jaguar. And I firmly believe that Jaguar probably wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the efforts of Tom Walkinshaw Racing and their successes, not only at Le Mans, but at Daytona, at Sebring, and within the World Sports Car Championship. And to our panel as well, who are part of that really special team. So a big round of applause to our panel. Tony Southgate, Alistair McQueen, Richard West, and Andy Wallace.